<clears throat> We're just letting participants in at the moment. You see the numbers going up. Here we've got 28 people have joined us so far, so I think we'll just get started. Um, so welcome to the latest in our Meet the Pioneers event, which today is going to be focusing on renewables trailblazers. I, I'm Lindsay Chalmers, I'm the Development Manager at Community Land Scotland, and I'm going to be chairing the event today. Um, so one of the kind of main philosophies around community land ownership is giving communities the ability to be able to control their own future through ownership. Uh, and over the years, renewable projects have been a really key part of that, both in generating an in income, but also in making communities more sustainable in terms of their energy supply. Um, and it's really, I think, the last six months have really highlighted how important it has been to have an economy where profits from renewables and other resources have been able to be invested back in communities when they need them uh, and not extracted out of the communities. So just a couple of housekeeping points before we kick off. Um, we're going to... Um, let all the speakers speak one after the other and then we'll take questions at the end and we've got about 40 minutes for questions so don't worry too much that you won't get a chance to ask your question and um, you can ask in either the Q&A facility or the chat facility and then we'll pick those up at the end and direct them to people so if there's someone in particular that you want to ask a question to just mention that when you put your question in. Um, so the order we're going to run in today um, is we're going to have Malcolm McMillan from McCannish Air Base Community Company up first talking about solar. Then we'll have Jamie Adam from Community Energy Scotland talking about wind power on the Isle of Canna. Uh, and finally, we'll have Murray Finch from Millennium Community Trust talking about microhydro. So I'm just going to hand over to Malcolm now and he's going to tell us all about what's happening with the solar project in McCannish. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um... So uh, thank you all. Good morning. Um, my name is Malcolm McMillan. I'm the Business Development Manager at Margaret Hanish Air Base Community Company. Uh, just a brief bit of background. Hopefully you can see on your screen um, an overview of the site. It's a former RAF air station which was sold to the community in 2012. Um, it is over 1,025 acres in size. Um, it's got one of the long longest runways in Scotland, over 3,000 metres long. It's got a high voltage electricity infrastructure, including 25 substations, um, and uh, over 150 people work from the site uh, as of today. Uh, it's got over 200 properties, 132 tenants, um, 18 kilometres of road, uh, a private water supply and a private sewage system, uh, and also a 250 kilowatt solar PV array. So it's quite an extensive piece of infrastructure. And um, we manage it um, on behalf of the community. Um, so next slide, please. So our renewables journey started in 2014. Um, since even before the buyout, we, we realized that renewables were going to form some part of the business. Uh, it took us a few years to get underway. Um, we got feasibility study uh, funding from Local Energy Scotland um, and also used some of our internal resources uh, towards that development. Um, we've had significant advice from um, all sorts of organisations, including Community Industry Scotland and Resource Efficient Scotland, uh, as well as other community groups as well, uh, which has been vital in terms of helping our journey. One of the big problems we had at the start was actually narrowing down what we were going to do um, and what we could do. And uh, so we considered all things from small wind, biomass, uh, even hydro. Um, a thousand acres of land some of that is actually 180 meters above us in a hill which is part of our forms part of our water supply so one of the considerations was hydro um, and as it turns out after a few years of development and consideration it wasn't going to be viable um, especially with the cutting the feed-in tax um, because it was too small to survive on its own um, but we also considered district heating for, from biomass and combined, combined heat and power uh, large scale solar and small and medium sized wind. Um, all of them were disregarded and really we settled on the solar PV uh, project and did some deep detail feasibility work into that and a business case. Next slide, please. So 
In terms of the energy, the main fuel on the site is used is electricity. Um, the site's class is an extra high voltage consumer. Um, and the consumption over the last uh, seven years is between 4.8 and 6 gigawatt hours of energy. It's an eye-watering amount of electricity. Um, and one of our uh, majority of that consumption has been from one consumer. Uh, Mark has to purchase all of the electricity and then recharge it and reclaim it to all of its tenants. So obviously that's a huge consideration for us in terms of cash flow, et cetera. Um, and, as, and Mark, uh, and it's a current business plan, aims to be carbon neutral by 2030 in terms of electricity and heating. So it's a huge challenge. And uh, that's slightly changed this year. And I'll explain why later on in, in the presentation. But um, as well as energy costs being a, a huge li potential liability, it's also a huge opportunity because we have, we're essentially an independent ENO. So uh, we don't have uh, as many restrictions on us as many community groups may face if you're just dealing directly with SSE or Scottish Power, we, we operate uh, our own well island, energy island essentially. Although we do obviously buy electricity in and I do have to uh, speak to SSE, we've got considerable capacity. Next slide, please. So after looking through all the considerations uh, from solar, we, um, we looked at various sizes. Um, we settled on 250 kilowatts to build out, um, but we decided that to, moving towards carbon neutrality by 2030, we would need more. Um, so we actually applied for plan permission for a megawatt. But the 250 kilowatts was, was chosen initially uh, after consideration of all sorts of things. So these are um, 2016 figures, so they're quite out of date. Um, and they're all based on not exporting to the grid because the site is grid constrained. Um, so the mo most we can uh, export is 50 kilowatts. Uh, hopefully that's going to lift in relatively soon, but uh, nothing's confirmed yet. And so that all, of, all these other considerations, finance method, grid constraints, uh, Mark's own charitable objectives. Um, we actually had to change our memorandum and articles of association uh, to include uh, renewable energy generating assets as part of this project. Um, our corporate structure, how would it be? How would it be? Would it be a, a separate trading arm or would it just be part of the charity? We decided that because of the scale was not too significant that we could just incorporate it as an asset of the charity. Um, and when we did that, that then kicked in the need to change our memorandum and articles of association, um, which was something we didn't really consider or never thought would be an issue um, at the outset. Um, and really the 250 kilowatt is, is sized for Mark's own consumption. Um, so really that, you know, we use slightly more than 230,000 kilowatts of electricity every year. Um, but we're hoping that with upgrades to some of the buildings and just getting more efficient in general, it will soon be below that. Um, so that was that was really the justification for going for 250 kilowatts. Uh, in terms of that table, uh, total project capexes were budget costs that the consultants gave us. Consultants were local gen, um, and I'd highly recommend local gen. Uh, we also use Skewer Energy uh, right out the outset, and again, very good consultants who are now known as Wood. Um, and then the local gen really held our hand through the planning, the final business for the case phase, the planning, and also uh, project management uh, of it. So, and, and I'd highly recommend if you can afford it for your project, get a project manager, find somebody like local gen who can hold your hand through it. Although solar is fairly simple in terms of its infrastructure and that sort of thing, there's a lot of complexity to, to these projects, even, even if they're only a few hundred thousand pounds. Um, so just main kind of points on that table, um, that estimate, they're all estimates, um, and the payback period was 11.2 uh, years, which is expected, um, and that's what that's what the board signed off on, so signed off expecting 11 years to pay back, which we thought was reasonable. Next slide, please. Planning and procurement. Planning was relatively simple. Um, as I said, a megawatt was applied for, um, and the, the although we, we knew we weren't going to build it out uh, to its full capacity initially, we um, allocated an area and fenced off an area um, that would be adequate in the future to do it, uh, to do a megawatt. Uh, generally, all the legislation is pro-renewables. 
Um, there's no objections from any locals or statutory bodies. The site master plan, so one of the things we had to do early, early doors and our, our ownership was uh, kind of get a form of master plan in, in place to try and help um, steer the, the site's development uh, and renewables featured heavily in that, but we didn't know exactly where, but it would fill in enough flexibility in order to do that. Um, the airport operator uh, on the site, because we do have an active uh, aviation aspect to, to the site, um, they were they were really our biggest concern, but from their perspective and from their safety, as long as it was south of the runway, they had no objections. So uh, it was all good from there. There's no environmental issues. The only thing that was a bit of a headache was the fact that we had to do an unexploded ordnance survey, obviously being an ex-military site, and there's always the risk of finding something that goes bam. And um, fortunately, we didn't find anything. Uh, and also the site came with an awful lot of information had already been thoroughly decontaminated and I'm um, glad to say that is actually true. Um, procurement, um, we got five responses to, to our tender. Um, all, all were under the business case um, of £275,000 considerably uh, by at least £15,000 and the cheapest quote was £90,000 less than our budget, which is huge um, in terms of our payback, etc. Uh, and, P and solar PV is so, so rapidly um, uh, coming down in cost even now. Um, I'd be very interested to see if we went for tender again, what that cost would actually be. Um, all the, the tender and, and contracts uh, were organized by lo local agendas project managers. It's a, the NEC3 contract is a standard engineering contract. Um, and it's essential to get the right, the right contract in place. Um, it's an industry standard one, so it talks about penalty clauses as clear roles and responsibilities, procedures for change management, and, and also disputes. So, and it, it really helped us uh, later on in the process with one issue that did crop up. Next, next slide, please. So these two photos uh, are before and during construction. And uh, the first kind of drone footage one just shows the area in question. It's a large flat site. The whole site is as flat as a pancake. And um, there's a few uh, small man-made hills, but apart from that, uh, very little problems in terms of shading. The main issues we had to consider were underground services, given the, the former use of the site. There used to be a bulk uh, fuel storage uh, a tank in the area, so we had to find it and avoid it. Um, wind loading, obviously, a very uh, big consideration in the west coast of Scotland. We, um, uh, we made sure that the panels uh, and the frames were well well specified and, and also had a good amount of warranty because it's going to get tested considerably uh, for wind. Um, we uh, also insisted on installing the panel height at 800 millimetres above the, the ground uh, because apparently at 600 millimetres, if you do graze it with sheep, which we intended to do and have done, um, they, they do a bit of damage like using the panels for a good scratching post and uh, it can do quite a lot of uh, damage from that. Um, so uh, 800 millimetres is just that slightly tall enough that uh, they can't get, uh, cause too much damage and scratch the panels. Um, the main issue during the construction were that we were connecting the grid restriction, because as I mentioned, we're grid restricted in terms of we can only export 50 kilowatts. Uh, it was actually installing the grid uh, restriction equipment. Um, and the, um, so that was the main, it caused a three month delay. It was, it was quite complicated, quite technical. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but um, it was something that we underestimated and also the contractor underestimated. Um, other issues uh, uh, that we came across was the contractor slapped in the, the, uh, the panels and unfortunately put them too low. So they then had to dig down underneath to make 800 mil uh, to allow the sheep to graze. Uh, sorry, next slide. That's a complete solar farm as it is. It's fairly unintrusive. Uh, looks quite good in my opinion. Um, next slide, please. So for operation maintenance, it's been running since uh, August 2018. Um, it's fairly light touch. Um, the first winter did reveal some loose panels, which fortunately didn't go too far, and we did manage to recover them and install them. And they were they're fairly sturdy. They're sturdier than the look. Um, and, and didn't require replacement, they just needed uh, to be put back on. We also tightened all the bolts. Um, weed maintenance is something that we need to consider. We graze everything else. 
uh, and we had one inverter failure, which was replaced under warranty. We do have some water ingress um, problems, some of the external paneling, uh, which all, all the electricity, connect, all the connections go through. Um, they're just not, not up to the west coast of Scotland uh, levels of rain and wind, I think. So we do have some issues with that, but it's fixed with some Sikaflex. Um, one of our biggest issues is the remote monitoring software. It's absolutely essential. Um, if you're going to be doing any renewables work, remote monitoring is definitely needed. Um, so highly recommend it, but it does cause, it has caused us a few problems. So again, if you ever get to that stage, I'm happy to discuss that with anybody. We do have an annual servicing requirement. Um, we do clean it from time to time, although fortunately we get so much rainfall, it's, uh, it mostly does that itself. And the performance, which is the graph on the chart there, um, has been within 5% of the projections. Next slide, please. So the actual performance of it, um, again, I talked about remote monitoring, and this is essentially what it tells you. The graph there um, just shows the, the consumption. 2020 has been a problem, uh, mainly because of the low consumption level. Essentially, uh, our, our major consumer doesn't use any electricity because they're closed. Uh, and therefore we've got to kind of manage that. And what we're finding, we have to physically turn off some of the solar farm in order to manage that um, uh, problem, although it's not an issue um, now that the winter's here. Uh, the, the other thing that remote more does is give you environmental contributions. So you can see the nuclear waste offset. We can do five, we've done, uh, produced enough electricity to go five million miles in a segue if you're so inclined. Um, final slide, please. Actual performance, this is what I, I can see. Um, so that's two very different days. Lovely day in July, uh, sorry, May, uh, typical day in October. Uh, so quite a considerable range of, of output. Um, in terms of development costs, uh, when you take in all the, 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 the consultant fees and planning fees, et cetera, uh, all the capital costs and operational costs, we're looking at a kind of payback of between eight and 10 years, um, depending on how things go. So. That's me. Thanks for that, Malcolm. I'd maybe foreseen you might have problems with rain, but I hadn't thought about an exploded ordinance or sheep as being a, an issue. And that was really interesting. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Jamie Adam from Community Energy Scotland to talk about what's happening in Canada. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, just to say, uh, seems like I can't share my video at the moment. It says host has stopped it. Um, I'm not sure if that'll stop me sharing screens or not, but I'll just try and do that just now. Is that working okay? Yeah, we can see that fine. Great. Okay, okay. Um, so, yep. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for um, having me on today. Um, I'm going to talk through the CANA uh, Renewable Energy and Electrification Project, which I was involved with um, a couple of years ago. So um, just to give a bit of um, background on the project, um, this is the Isle of CANA, as viewed from a, a flight out to Ben Benkula. Um, it's uh, a small island uh, off the west coast of Skye. It's about um, four miles long by one wide. Um, the population, I think, at the moment is, is around about 18. Um, and the island's been fully owned by the National Trust for Scotland since 1981. Um, there's no connection to the national grid at all. Um, uh, the, the first um, island electrical network was installed in the year 2000. And um, it was initially just running on diesel generators. Um, Community Energy Scotland first got involved in 2009, um, helping with things like feasibility studies into a, a microgrid scheme involving wind, PV and storage. And we've been involved for, for a number of years since. Um, obviously, with, with a, a very small population, it's quite a vulnerable and a very busy community. Um, everyone has, has multiple jobs typically, and um, it's quite hard to, to find time to um, develop um, large and complex projects like these. Um, but ultimately, the, the community managed to secure um, 
capital funding to build a community-owned energy scheme in 2017. So uh in terms of what the project uh is the the design was initially by a company called wind and sun limited who have a lot of experience of off-grid projects they've been involved in similar schemes on uh on egg and muck and uh, places like fula as well it's got a very similar electrical design to the system that was installed on the isle of muck in 2012-2013 um, so it uses uh, six of the six kilowatt SD wind turbines, uh, which is the same design, the same company effectively as uh, Proven or, or Kingspan. Um, there is also 30 kilowatt peak of ground mounted solar PV, uh, plus some additional roof mounted solar that we're able to add later on. 159 kilowatt hours of uh, lead acid battery storage. And the project was involved um, building a new battery inverter building and a separate inverter building for the uh, the wind turbines as well. Um, we also, with some of the funding we had, uh, were able to replace one of the old uh, diesel generators um, because they were approaching the end of their lives. So in terms of funding and financing, um, this was quite an expensive project around 1.3 million pounds um, in total so there was a big job to do in, in raising the the funds to, to make it happen initially some of the development funding was um, uh, through the Scottish government's community and renewable energy scheme um, that funded the initial feasibility study back in 2009 and uh, some uh, development work since so um, the schemes now delivered by Local Energy Scotland and they can offer enablement grants of up to £25,000, development loans of up to £150,000 and also innovation grants of around £150,000. So uh, well worth speaking to them if you're, if you're planning a, a community energy project. In terms of the capital expenditure, um, uh, the community had already secured uh, a very substantial grant from um, the big lottery fund, as it was called then, and their growing community assets scheme. Um, when uh, the community asked us to come on board and project manage the, the scheme through from uh, planning through to commissioning, uh, we managed to secure some additional funding. Uh, so there was 150,000 from the CARES programme, 50,000 from the National Trust and 50,000 from the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. The community had already secured 150,000 in addition from SSE's Highland uh, Sustainable Development Fund, which again was used for some of the reconstruction uh, development work. Just to mention a few other funds which uh, we didn't apply to, uh, but would be worth knowing about if you're looking at taking forward a, a community energy project. Uh, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme, or LCITP, this is another Scottish Government fund. They put out um, periodic calls um, based on um, uh, different technologies. So. Uh, that's well worth looking at, particularly if you're doing uh, quite an innovative uh, type of project, that could be a good source of funding. There's also the Network Innovation Competition, um, which uh, Ofgem administer. Uh, that's uh, a total fund of around £70 million a year. It's only open to the network operators like SSE and Scottish Power, but um, in the past they've um, collaborated uh, with, with us and indeed community groups to take forward um, innovative um, electrical projects as well. So, so that can be a good route for funding. There's Horizon 2020, various different funding streams from, uh, from there have been used on community energy projects, uh, particularly in places like Orkney and the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, which is funding the, the big reflux project that we're involved with in, in Orkney at the moment. A few other technology-specific funds as well. 
um, for transport, um, while we're speaking to Energy Saving Trust, um, they can offer grants for electric vehicles and also uh, support for car clubs. Um, the District Heating Loan Fund is another scheme administered by the Energy Saving Trust. And if you're looking at um, installing some form of district heating scheme, um, then that's a, a good source of um, low interest uh, finance to, to help um, community groups, councils, housing associations build out heat networks. Uh, and then lastly, a few different funds um, targeted around social impact and fuel poverty. So the Green Economy Fund delivered by Scottish Power in their operating area has funded a lot of different community initiatives. Um, we've also had support from the Robertson Trust for things like our Community Energy Futures Programme. Climate Challenge Fund, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. There's also the Energy uh, Redress Fund, which is another off-gem um, uh, grant scheme. And then lastly, the, the lottery have a number of different um, funds available. So these are all worth uh, looking into if you're taking forward the project. In terms of land ownership um, on, on Kana, uh, normally for a project like this, the big lottery would have um, looked for the land to be owned, uh, but they were willing to accept a, a long lease instead, which is uh, what we um, negotiated um, ultimately. I think the project definitely would have been easier if the land had been owned by the community, but um, due to the way the National Trust is set up, they would actually require an act of parliament to dispose of any land, and so that wasn't really an option. Um, some of the land um, on, uh, on Sandy, where the turbines were built, um, is, uh, is also, also croft land. Um, we had to run a cable across someone's croft, um, which is a slight additional complication for the legal work. But the crofters were all fully supportive, so that wasn't ultimately a, a major issue or, or hurdle. But the, um, overall, getting the lease in order, it was quite complex and uh, quite expensive as well. So it's, it's definitely really important um, on a project like this to have experienced lawyers who are familiar with renewable energy, ideally community energy too, and certainly um, more specialist areas uh, such as um, working around croft land as well. Uh, so our role, as mentioned, was to uh, project manage the uh, the scheme through from uh, planning consent um, uh, right to um, uh, commissioning of the project. The principal contractor uh, was SSE Contracting, who've been involved in a lot of the um, the off grid networks. They um, they were the principal contractor for the egg scheme as well, similarly for for muck and uh, more recently fair oil too uh, so they were a principal contractor uh, involved in um, uh, setting up all the site compound and so on and, uh, and also carried out all the electrical works on the project a company called chap from aberdeenshire um, did the civil works um, subcontracted to sse um, they uh, they were very good did a, a very solid job and Wind and Sun, who I mentioned earlier, um, were again subcontracted by SSC to, to do the renewable and storage elements. So they installed the battery systems and the PV arrays. And turbines, as I said earlier, were supplied from SD Wind. And they set up their, their own team to do the installation work on them. So having a specialist team used to working in remote locations on, on off-grid networks was, was really important because these are quite unusual um, and, and complex projects. So uh, a few photos now. Um, this was some of the, um, the equipment being delivered at the outset of the project. Quite complex logistics um, here. There, there is a roll on roll off ferry, but it serves all the small isles and is, is quite busy. Um, and so most of the uh, plant and uh, equipment was uh, brought in by chartered landing craft. Um, and that included the accommodation. Uh, there, there wasn't enough accommodation on the island um, to, to house uh, all the contractors when they were working there. 
so these uh, bunk cabins had to be brought into um, uh, to, to house all the, uh, the the workers for the duration of the project. Um, this was some initial site clearance work. There was an old ruined tin shed that was removed to make way for the new uh, wind turbine inverter building. Um, the, um, the site here um, near is where the central battery um, uh, building is going to be created is also where the, uh, the PV array um, was built. We looked at a number of different options for the foundations to try and minimize costs, uh, including bringing in prefabricated concrete slabs or uh, or, or drilling um, down into the ground instead of using concrete. But um, because there was bedrock quite close to the surface, ultimately it was it was easiest to batch concrete on site and uh, and, and pour concrete foundations. So that's the solar arrays installed uh, again. Nice and high up so that uh, sheep can graze underneath without uh, damaging them at all. This is the uh, inside of the uh, the inverter room um, under construction. So the grey boxes on the right are the battery chargers and inverters um, that uh, that regulate the power bank, and, and they they really effectively run the grid um, uh, through constantly monitoring how much. Uh, how much load is going out and how much generation is coming in and uh, the batteries just smooth out all the voltage and frequency on the system. The blue boxes on the left are some of the inverters for the uh, ground mounted PV array. And this is our batteries. Um, they had to be in a separate room because these are vented lead acid batteries. So when they're charging, they can release some hydrogen. So that has to be in a, a separate room to all the electrical equipment. And you have to think carefully about uh, ventilation as well to uh, allow any um, hydrogen to dissipate safely. Um, these are the, first the wind turbines going up. Um, they, they're all installed on hydraulic towers, which allowed for quite easy installation. That also means that they can be um, maintains more readily on the island without having to, to bring on a, a crane, um, which is, is useful given the, the location. That's the completed wind turbine inverter room. Um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the wall behind was increased in height slightly. Um, this is the kind of look that the planners were, were keen to see to replicate the building that was there before. And that's our the uh, solar array um, completed um, with some additional panels going up on, on the barn roof. We ended up making some savings during construction and had a bit of money left over. And so we were able to, um, to use that to install this, uh, this extra solar. A lot of the other community microgrids have found that um, uh, where they really needed the extra energy was was in the summertime um, when uh, when winds are low and there's lots of visitors to the island. So having more solar is always a good investment. That's the turbines all up and spinning. And the finished um, uh, battery inverter building as well. So we were lucky to, enough to have the, the energy minister, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, came to, to open the scheme in uh, April 2009. And uh, so that was a great shindig with a, a good Kaylee afterwards as well. Um, and uh, that's the members of the community, along with the minister, who's launching the, the island's strategy on that day as well. So just to finish up, um, in terms of some of the challenges uh, on the project, uh, that was something to consider carefully. We could have done the project through an existing community organisation, the Isle of Canada Community Development Trust, but they didn't want to that register for their other activities. Um, so we set up uh, the new company, Creel, to, um, to look after the energy project and it became that registered. We needed some additional funding um, pre-build to cover the full costs um, because those had, those had increased. Um, so, so that was the funding that we secured from CARES and HI and National Trust. Quite complex arrangements with National Trust on the generators um, so that they would be comfortable with us taking over the system. 
uh, and obviously weather and transport was was a big factor as well getting everything to this uh, quite remote site when ferries are, are frequently off in the winter in particular um, we had multiple funders to report to and prepare claims for all with their own kind of processes but we um, we agreed a common reporting structure at the outset which uh, which worked well and kept them all happy and then also it was really important to ensure that all the equipment was robust and could be kind of locally maintained as far as possible as well, given the, the location. But as well as challenges, some significant successes. So um, this week marks two full years of operation for the scheme. Um, I don't have all the stats for the past year, but in the first year of operation, 93% of everything generated by Creel was renewable. Um, and that translated to a 94% reduction in diesel use because the diesel generators were running more efficiently as well and over 100 tonnes of carbon dioxide saved. So the, the generators were, that were previously running 24-7 are now typically running less than three times a month on average just for a few hours when necessary to top up the batteries. So it's far more resilient now the network to future oil price increases it also has a far better power quality. The, the voltage and frequency of the system are, are a lot stronger than, than they were. And um, I was really pleased that the, the project was the, the winner of the 2019 um, Scottish Renewables uh, Green Energy Award for Best Community Project as well. So that's a real testament to the, the community and their, their tenacity in, the, in getting this done. Uh, so that's all from me, um, but yeah, I'd be very happy to um, answer any questions after Mary's presentation. Thanks, Jamie. That's really interesting and fantastic to hear about the reduction in diesel use on Canna. Um, so next up, uh, we have Mary Finch from Mullinana Community Trust is going to talk about their micro hydro. I hear you've been getting perfect weather on Mull for your hydro over the last couple of days. And um, so just if you want to just run us through how that project developed. Thanks, Mary. You're on mute, Mary. Hello, can you hear me now? We can. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, this is Murray Finch, General Manager of Mullinayona Community Trust. I'm going to talk today about the background to the story behind Garmony Hydro and uh, to help you understand what a tremendous success it's been for the local community. So back in 2009, 2010, there was a group of volunteers on the island uh, who were keen to improve the sustainability of island life. Uh, they formed a group called Mull Renewables um, and one of the key targets that they set uh, for themselves was to be able to generate renewable energy on the island. Uh, looking at the options that were available for us, the, the lowest cost to market I think would have been through uh, wind, but the big issue that was uh, facing everybody then was the fact that Mull is, is also known as Eagle Island. And because of all the Schedule 1 raptors that we have, that we're fortunate enough to have on the island, uh, it was felt that a large scale wind project uh, couldn't be taken forward after um, a couple of attempts in the north of the island uh, failed primarily due to overlap with Eagle territories uh, and some local opposition related to that. Um, Sorry, my battery was just running flat. I think we might have temporarily lost Murray. I don't know if that's down to his battery. I sure if he's going to come back to us in a couple of minutes. Um, but while we wait for that, maybe 
Um, good to get some Q and A's going for the other two panelists. If you're avail available to come back. Um, yep. I um, <laughs> yes, I'm still here. And um, well, I'll just ask a question to get us going for the moment. Um, I was just wondering about how you find the whole kind of system of raising finance. Do you think that did that system work for you? Are there things that like that could be done better? Or do you think it's you know a pretty sophisticated system that's been developed for communities that want to develop their own energy? Do you want to go first, Jamie? Sure, yeah. Um yes, it, it depends a lot on the type of project that you're looking to take forward, I think. Um one like uh, Kana, uh, you you wouldn't really be able to raise finance for something like that through commercial banks. Um, it it just um, wouldn't wouldn't be viable, and is is probably too kind of innovative for for banks to look for. Um, but we're lucky that there are quite a number of sources, like the ones I I mentioned in my presentation, who are um, very keen to to fund innovative projects like that, particularly one with, with really strong social outcomes as well as environmental impact. Um, for more commercial projects, um, it's definitely uh, more of a challenge now um, without the feed-in tariff being in place. Um, uh, but I think um, solar is a really interesting area where the costs are continuing to come down quite significantly. Um, and uh, so that, that is an area where it is probably possible to, to find commercial finance, um, particularly from uh, lenders like, uh, like Triodos, um, who, are, who are very keen to see kind of green projects go ahead. Um, another, um, another aspect is that if you can do a project um, uh, like, uh, like Malcolm uh, outlined, where you have a lot of on-site use, rather than uh, relying on, on export prices, which are a lot lower than that can, um, yeah, that can make projects a lot more viable as well. Yeah, we, we cheated um, uh, in that we, we funded it with our own internal resources. So it was relatively simple. Um, we, at the time with the business case, it was, the, if we considered um, debt finance or some other sort of finance, we would have, you know, the, it may not have passed the business case um, stage. So um, for us, we're quite fortunate. If we did it in the future, we would be more confident um, and probably look at debt finance or share issue or something like that. We have Murray back. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry, everybody. Um, I hope that nobody heard me. Um, Losing a few expletives when everything <laughs> disappeared off the screen there. No, we, we missed that, but <laughs> are you ready to go, go again if we pass back yes, to you? Yes, yes. Thanks. Here we go. So uh, I can't remember quite where I was, but um, suffice to say that out of all the renewable energy options that we're facing, as um, the group agreed to uh, select hydro as the preferred option. So thanks to a grant from the, um, the care scheme from the Scottish Government through Community Energy Scotland, we appointed a, a consultant called Mott MacDonald, who carried out a, an island-wide survey of the various burns that were available to us. Uh, they provided a, a summary table of um, six options outlining the capital costs, the potential income streams, and the complexity of the build, as uh, not least of which was land ownership. Uh, and the favoured option there, quite a standout option there, was um, at a place called Garmony Hydro, uh, just behind Garmony Rugby Club. Partly because it was on land owned by uh, Forestry Commission Scotland, uh, rather than a private landowner. We're not moving forwards. So, a lot of the um, a lot of the memories that we have going back ten years, uh, are that there were lots of things that uh, going into the project we didn't know about. So we've gained an awful lot of experience, which we're hoping that we'll be able to use again in future. And this coined the phrase, "You don't know what you don't know." So. 
one of the problems that we faced uh, initially was that with development funding from both CARES and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, we then had to fathom out how we could spend that money in a way that didn't compromise the income stream coming from the feed-in tariff. Uh, and I was interested to hear one of the earlier speakers um, describe how they got public money um, and still managed to secure um, the business case from the income streams that they could develop. So we had to be very careful about how we allocated the, the grant funding that we had to the, uh, the costs associated in the development phase. Uh, what we were able to do then was to uh, award a detailed design contract to Campbells of Doom, uh, who took forward all of the work for us uh, as a professional team carrying out the contract management for the project. We then had to make sure that we had access to the land and to the burn itself, which we did through the National Forest Land Scheme. Um, we had to prove under the rules of that scheme that we had support from the local community. So we set about uh, as a group of uh, probably 10, 10 volunteers heading around the island uh, meeting or joining meetings of, of parent councils and village hall committees and garden clubs and so on, trying to uh, get as many people as possible on side with the project so that they could all understand the ins and outs of it. The ballot that we carried out was managed for us independently by electoral reform services from London uh, and they, they managed it as a postal ballot for us uh, so there was no um, no possibility of any local interference or accusations of local interference with the outcome uh, of the ballot. And just to mention that the National Forest Land Scheme has now been superseded by the Community Asset Transfer Scheme. Uh, if anybody's looking to um, buy or lease land from what is now called uh, Forest Greenland Scotland. So the outcome of the ballot was pretty stunning, uh, exceeded all our expectations. Uh, suffice to say that despite a, a pretty high turnout of 70% uh, of the residents of the island, the figure at the bottom there was the one that we were most proud of, and that was that there was still an overall majority uh, of the island in total uh, that were in favour of the project. So we then, through the professional team, had a tender to um, build the designed project. Um, and unlike the, the MAC project where they, uh, they had five competent bids, we ended up with, with actually just two. Uh, and one of those bids was, was effectively priced so high that we were convinced that they'd um, deliberately set the price high so that they didn't win the contract simply because they were so busy at that time building uh, Run of River Hydro schemes elsewhere on the west coast of Scotland. Um, fortunately for us, we did have one competent bid uh, and that was from a locally based contractor on the island called TSL. The other aspect of the project that was um, almost a, uh, a job stopper for us was the grid connection. Um, the offer that, that we got from the network operator on the face of it was pretty attractive. Uh, the, the cost was very affordable, um, but when we got on to, uh, it must've been about page 33 of the grid connection offer, we found that the, um, the connect, the connectivity problem that we had um, with the grid constraint at Tainult on the mainland meant that essentially uh, SSE couldn't confirm when we'd have a, a, a grid connection for the full 400 kilowatts and they couldn't confirm how much it would cost. So that meant that against a, a background of digression of the feed-in tariff uh, at national level, uh, the financial basis for the project was waning away before our eyes. So we took up extensive lobbying of all the stakeholders involved uh, with a lot of input from Felix White at Community Energy Scotland. We had a, um, 
almost like a summit meeting of all the stakeholders at Inverary Hotel in August 2012. And the outcome of that was that SSE uh, networks agreed to make contact with all of the holders of connection contracts, which hadn't been developed either because, because of financing problems or because they hadn't been consented by the planning authorities. Um, and we were very, very fortunate that a, a project on sale for a wind farm uh, had been rejected at public inquiry. So uh, that released 10 megawatts of uh, capacity into our grid area. So immediately we, uh, we accepted our grid connection offer uh, and we were good to go. We established a separate standalone organization called Green Energy Mall to own and operate the system. Uh, and looking at the way that we were going to finance the project, it was decided that uh, the best legal form for us to adopt was the Industrial and Providence Society operating as a community benefit society. And the main reason for that was that we would have the powers both to borrow money, uh, to receive donations, and to uh, issue community shares and raise, raise share capital for the construction cost. So, Securing the, um, the commercial loans, um, which went into the 1.5 million pound finance package, on the face of it sounds really easy. Uh, and this turned into one of the most frustrating parts of the project uh, that, that we had. Um, the time taken uh, and the money that we had to spend um, going through due diligence, paying the lawyers uh, was, obscene uh, as far as we were concerned i think we ended up spending something like eighty thousand pounds in legal fees um, and just stealing my own thunder from some of the subsequent slides the plant was commissioned in june 2015 but we only achieved financial close in march of that year um, and at one point it was it looked like the plant was going to be finished before the banks had agreed to lend us the final bits of the money so we were operating at risk for a great deal of the construction period. The community share offer closed early in 2014 um, and we, we raised something like 486,000 pounds of community shares. So roughly about a third of the capital cost. The income streams that the project were based on were around the export tariff to the national grid and the feed-in tariff scheme. Uh, and because of a mix up uh, on the information that was available to the communities um, when we were registering for the pre-accreditation pre for the feed-in tariff, we found ourselves on the wrong side of a, um, a threshold date, which meant that the income stream was going to be um, reduced for us significantly. Um, we were very aggrieved by this. Community Energy Scotland were on our side. They had agreed that the information that we based our initial application for pre-accreditation was, was, was flawed. We took it up with our MP. We met with the coalition government in Westminster at the time, uh, and they agreed that the only solution was uh, to come up with a change in the law, which allowed us to withdraw our pre-accreditation approval and to resubmit. So, as well as all the other things that we achieved during the construction of Garmony Hydro, we actually achieved a change in UK law to allow us to do it specifically and only for, um, for green energy mill there. Garmony Hydro was then duly completed in June 2015. So this is a, a photo of the weir at the top of the hill. Uh, that's looking very serene. And as Lindsay said in the introduction there, uh, it's anything but at the moment. Uh, we've got some pretty heavy rain happening. And whereas on that photograph, we've got some nice laminar flow coming across the top of the screen, uh, probably at about 30 or 40 millimetres depth. It's something like uh, 1,200 millimetres above the top of the weir at the moment. 120 millimetres above the top of the weir, sorry. There's a photo of the turbine inside the turbine house with all of the control panels uh, on the left. And 
we had a visit from the then Islands Minister Derek Mackay uh, at the official opening ceremony for the project. Um, so performance to date, the expectations that we had uh, for a bankable project to persuade the commercial lenders uh, were all um, based around a, an annual production of 1,105,000 kilowatt hours. So just over one megawatt hours per year. Uh, and in each of the uh, subsequent complete financial years, you can see there that um, there is evidence, I believe, of, of climate change. Uh, all the rainfall predictions have been exceeded. Um, and the business case has been an, a, a pretty outstanding success for us. The profits from the project have been gifted each year into a standalone charity that we set up called the Waterfall Fund. Uh, which was established in January 2015 as effectively to operate as a community benefit fund, receiving the gifted profits from Green Energy Mull and distributing them to the communities of Mull and Iona. And so far, we've accumulated £185,000 of benefit direct into the local community from Garmony Hydro. So that's me come to the end of the presentation and I hope you're all still there and with me. Thanks, Maria. We're all still here and we've still got, got an audience. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, feel free to type them into the Q&A or chat box. I was struck by something you said, Maria, but what you, you don't know what you don't know. I think that's kind of almost like a strap line for community land ownership, that ability to um, absorb huge amounts of information and go and talk to people and learn things which seem like really technically complicated. And that, you know, that whole ability to kind of deal with risk as well and be willing to lie awake at night wondering if your loans are going to come through. But also, I think um, another really key part of the community land sector is that can never give up spirit and been able to overcome obstacles. And I think you've done quite well on that given that you managed to change the law. <laughs> Um, to kind of um, help you with some really difficult circumstances. Um, while we wait for some Q&A to come in, my, you were just saying that you thought like everything you've learned in the last kind of period while you've gone through this process, you want to use again. What, what are your plans for the future on that? Do you think you'll develop any more energy projects? Um, we were slightly despondent, I think, a few years ago when there was no successor to the feeding tariff, um, which... I think caused um, a degree of, of concern in terms of being able to develop new community owned schemes. But just see, just from today, personally, I've, I've, I've gleaned some encouragement that, um, you know, it's, it is possible still uh, to secure a bankable project with grant income so that you're not having to service the loans. Jamie, what are your kind of thoughts for your Community Energy Scotland hat on about what you know what the future is for community energy? Is it is it a rosy future? Are things going to get a bit easier, or is it going to be be tougher in the future? I don't know about easier, but um, I think it, the sector certainly has a very um, strong future ahead and a really important role to play in the the energy transition and moving towards net zero. Um, I think there will be some sites where generation is still viable, particularly very uh, high wind sites, um, perhaps with uh, bigger turbines where the, you get more economies of scale. But I think more and more of what we'll, what we'll see is community energy moving from just being about generation um, towards um, looking at the demand side as well. Um, so we can see a lot of innovation happening um, around electric vehicles, for instance, and communities setting up local car clubs, uh, linking in those uh, those cars so that they charge off um, uh, the solar canopies, for instance, that might be installed by the, the host community. And um, lots of projects as well around flexibility provisions. So as we see more and more renewables coming onto the grid nationally, 
um, there is going to be a requirement to to manage that because the, um, the you get the energy when you get it according to the weather. Um, at times, there is going to be more than we need. Um, so finding ways to uh, to store that energy until we need it, and and also to to use it locally, so that we're not as reliant on upgrading national transmission systems. These are all going to be areas where communities have a really important role to play, um, and indeed um, a, a lot of the, those um, those aspects were were trialled in the the access project that we did uh, along with um, uh, in um, in. Uh, yeah, in the, the Garmany area a few years ago. Um, got a question from Emma and Margaret, and again for you, Jamie, about is there, are there any other cutting edge technologies that we've not talked about today that are being piloted in Scotland and is Tidal part of that? Yeah, um, I think I think Tidal does have a, a strong future. Um, it's probably been more successful than than Wave so far. It's still relatively early days for the for the technology. Um, there are some uh, commercial arrays now in in operation, um, but uh, at a community level, it's still very very expensive and risky. So I suspect um, it may be some time yet before we see significant community title projects. But I think a lot of the really interesting emerging technologies are around flexibility and smart grids and, uh, and batteries as well. Um, we've got an interesting situation, uh, kind of an unfortunate situation happening at the moment where the subsea cable to the Western Isles failed about 10 days ago, um, which has meant that um, uh, all of uh, Lewis and Harris are being powered by diesel generators at the moment, and all the wind turbines have had to um, largely turn off or, or just go to very minimal output. So we're looking um, actively at, at ways that we can work with the community wind generators there to link their turbines to battery storage to give a smoother output and, and allow them to displace some of the, the diesel that SSC are having to use to power the islands. So a lot of scope for really interesting storage technology, I think. Um, we've got a question from Nick Turdoff asking about what the current understanding is about viability of community grids. So um, it's, uh, it depends on the context. Um, uh, Off-grid um, networks such as CANA, um, uh, you, you kind of only really do that if you have to, if you had a choice to economically connect to the national grid, um, that would uh, that would save a fair amount of hassle and um, might be a cheaper option, but it's something that we've looked at for other um, communities that are off grid as well. So Noidart, for instance, um, they're they're uh, just undergoing a big renewal of their pipeline at the moment. Before spending a lot of money on that, we went to SSE to look about getting a grid connection instead. You were talking 13, 14 million pounds. So um, we're in, in those kind of contexts where there is no connection, uh, it makes absolute sense certainly to install a community grid based around uh, renewables that, that will definitely save energy. Um, I wouldn't necessarily take an existing bit of uh, network off grid because generally you're cheaper effectively using the grid as a battery. But um, there's certainly a lot of scope for um, kind of microgrids that uh, Malcolm was talking about, whereby um, the community owns uh, uh, a private network that's still connected into the national grid, but by having um, generation and potentially storage behind that, you can save a huge amount on your, your import costs and avoid having to uh, sell a lot of your generation for, for a very low value as well. So I think, yeah, good prospects there. We've got a few, quite a few members of Community Land Scotland who've got microgrids because they've got so many island-based members. Mm -hmm. um, question for you, Murray, from Di, asking about your amazing 485,000 community share offer, um, asking what level of payback you promise shareholders over what time period, and do you think any of those shares were effectively donations? Um, 
we don't promise any payback. Um, the prospectus that we put together makes clear that there is a risk uh, of there being no return on the investment and the fact that the community shares don't increase, in, can never increase in value, that they're, they're not tradable in the conventional sense. Uh, and as well as not increasing in value, there is a risk that if the project were to fail, that you know they could lose all the value. Um, so there, a lot of the investors were ethical in terms of wanting to support renewable energy and wanting to support communities. The prospectus um, offer was that the returns could be up to 4%. And year on year, since we've started operating, we've actually been returning the maximum 4% to the shareholders each year. So particularly at the moment where, you know, there is talk of, of, of negative interest rates. I don't, that's just a scary concept. Um, to be able to return plus 4%, I think is, uh, is, is pretty amazing. That is very impressive. And I suppose the question about whether some of them were effectively donations, only time will tell. I know Community Share Scotland think that um, for some community share offers, people are effectively happy to part with their money for something that's got such positive uh, benefits for society and for the community. Yes, uh, you know, we have, we have a couple of um, high level uh, or significant in investors um, who aren't interested in even receiving the interest on the shares. I suspect in due course, you know, they will, they will write off their investment uh, and not require us to repay it. So indeed, some of the investors will be donating their initial investment to us. Maury, well, just because I have a question, um, but why, why didn't you go more more community share rather than low and what was the thinking behind the split from a million to 485,000? The initial target, gosh, this was six or seven years ago. I think the initial target was, was 250,000. Right. So we, we significantly exceeded the target. And um, I think even after the official closing date, we were still getting some interest and accepting uh, the, the investments there. But it is eventually it, it petered out. So we are still considering refinancing the project, uh, repaying some of the uh, commercial loans uh, and offering further community shares. So even at 4% on community shares, uh, we would be better off Paying than paying something like between seven and eight uh, percent on the reef loan renewable energy investment fund from Scottish government, um, and given that at this stage um, we've got a track record now of, of five years of exceeding budgeted generation compared to the time in 2014, 2013 when we hadn't even built the plant, the the risk profile of the project is significantly different at the moment. And the only reason that the only barrier to us at the moment are uh, a, a clause or is a clause in the loan agreement whereby there is effectively a, a penalty clause for early repayment. Mm. So it's a question of, you know, that we take a hit of, oh, I think it was about 25,000 pounds to repay the loan early, um, you know, and then there's a, you can maybe understand the maths there. Yeah. Um, Occasionally, occasionally you might be in the situation where if you end up seeking a, a smaller amount than say a million pounds from commercial funders you'll struggle to attract as much interest um, particularly if it's you know, non-recourse um, project finance because there's there's quite a amount of work involved for uh, for both the funder and the community develop the community developer in, in going through the due diligence process. So very often, around about a million pounds will be the kind of minimum threshold for them to pick up their ears. But um, 
certainly options like Reef or or EF as it is now, the Energy Investment Fund have, have been yeah really useful sources of finance for uh, for community projects, and it's it's great that that's something that the Scottish government offers. I just asked Mary, did you offer social investment tax return, or did you apply for it and get it for your project? We did, yes. C E I S and then E I S. So long ago, I can't remember what they stand for. Energy? No, I can't remember it. I can't remember it. Do you, do you think that made any difference in terms of attracting investors to the community share offer? I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did at the time. Uh, and I do remember there was a there, there was a a transition between the more attractive C E I S before it reverted to the less attractive EIS, where people were, were flocking, you know, to get in before the, the threshold date. Well, sorry, one more question, if you don't mind, um, Maury, just in terms of uh, the, the due diligence costs, what, what was cheaper, the share offering or the, or the loan? Share offering. If, 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 you, wow. if, if you can avoid, Going through a commercial bank, do so, is you know our lesson that we would take into another renewable energy project. I think the community share offers have got additional benefits as well, and that it does make people feel more bought into the whole idea, and so people are generally more supportive. Of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, it's it's certainly it's always a very expensive process going through. Um, due diligence with the bank um, as developer, you effectively pay everyone's legal costs. You pay the legal costs for the, for the landowner very often and for yourself and uh, for the bank as well. Um, all that said, I mean, the due diligence process, whilst painful, it, it is useful and, uh, and, and can help pick up things that uh, that, that might have been missed. But, uh, but yeah, certainly uh, the kind of, lighter touch approach through community share offers is, um, uh, is is attractive, particularly for smaller schemes, I guess, that might struggle to um, uh, to get commercial finance or, or, or would struggle to, to bear all the full costs of um, uh, full due diligence process. On a lighter note, for investors in community shares for hydro projects, there are mental health benefits like when it's raining at the moment, <laughs> everybody feels, you know, a little bit, there is an upside to it. Yep. We all need Rainy. that at the moment. Rainy day, mummy, it's a good thing. <laughs> I think that's the end of our questions. I think that must be a reflection on the fact that you all gave such good summaries um, in your presentations. We'll have a look on if we've got one more. Coming in. I I'm just... I've, I've, I've just got a question for Jamie, if I may. Sure. Um, so I noticed that Canna secured a uh, grant from SSE. Uh, and whenever we've spoken with SSE about the, the, the geographical element of their, their support for communities, Mull is always outside of that, uh, that scope. So I just wonder how uh, an electric island like Canna, as well as a geographic island, uh, managed to secure support from SSE? Yeah, I wasn't involved in securing that funding, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think they have they have slightly different processes um, for, for their grant funding, because as I understand it, the, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Fund is... is a form of their community benefit fund for their large wind farms. So I think a certain amount is perhaps targeted uh, near those uh, those wind farm locations. So it might be that if they don't have any near mull that you wouldn't fall into the, the eligibility criteria for those. But I believe they do have a kind of a, a wider fund as well covering say the whole of the highlands, which, which is the fund that um, uh, that kind of were able to, to tap into. But um, I think they, they go through different kind of rounds of funding as well. So it's sometimes just about, um, you yeah, know, getting in there at the, the, the right time to, to be eligible. Well, we have a question from Neil McKinnon at Golston Estate uh, about the impact on Canis with the wider benefits. Um, has it increased um, 
Has it led to household energy efficiency improvements, employment opportunities, increase in population or any follow on investment? Do you have any information on that? Yeah, so um, it's been really good to see that uh, uh, they're now undertaking uh, a project around housing. Um, availability of housing on the island is a real issue and energy was a real constraint to that. Uh, the National Trust weren't keen to see um, any new houses built until um, the energy system was um, uh, improved uh, to, to enable uh, new houses to come onto the grid. Um, Electrically, as I mentioned, the design is very similar to that on Muck, which has a larger population of about 38. So there's definitely room for expansion there. And uh, the community are very keen to, to attract more folk to the island and um, enabling that through, through more housing will be a big part of that. Um, energy efficiency is an interesting one as well. And I know that that's something that the, um, uh, that the community are, are looking at as part of this project and they're, they're thinking about options for uh, for renewable heating, for instance, and um, uh, possibly even electric vehicles as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and another question from Di about um, your views on grid constraint issues and how community initiatives can overcome them. And Malcolm, I'm just wondering if you could say anything about that. Um, yeah. I think in Argyle it is slowly improving. Um, we, when we initially developed the project, it gave the date of 2021, um, which is looking pretty bad. Long, but I think initially it's 2023 and it's moved to 2021. So it is improving slowly, um, but it's extremely expensive um, to kind of put your place in the grid queue, especially if you don't have a community organization without a substantial income. Um, so it's still, Still very much in the realm of, of developers. Um, it'd be nice to see a bit of uh, leeway for communities, of which there is some, but not much. Um, how did you find that, Amal? It sounds like you benefited from another scheme on the mainland not happening. Yeah, we did, but within a, within a few weeks, I think that liberated capacity had been mocked up by other schemes as well. You know, so we're back to square one at the moment, although. Of Gem are proceeding with the to relieve that constraint at 10 alt at the moment. Um, as you will see, if you drive drive uh, along the road there, you'll see there are all sorts of signs objecting to uh, the reinforcement of the grid through there. So that's that's still some way away. Um, I think in terms of trying to develop a new scheme on the wrong side of that constraint, it makes it more important, I think, uh, to or more sensible to go for community shares because trying to convince a commercial lender, a commercial loan um, funder, that one day that constraint will be removed. So please just invest in the project or support the project uh, because it will come eventually. I think they're so risk averse, commercial loan, um, uh, commercial lenders, that. You just couldn't get your projects off the ground. So that's another reason for, for going the community shares route. Jamie, what's the kind of bigger picture? Is, is, is there hope in the long term that these things will become a bit easier? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I think local supply and flexibility is, is going to be a, um, a kind of key part of that um, as well. So at the moment, a lot of the uh, the, there can be a lot of different reasons for grid constraints, but often it is at a kind of national grid transmission level of just being able to get all the renewable generation um, from, from north of Scotland down to Central Belt and, and so on down to England as well. And those transmission constraints take a long time to overcome and, and they're very expensive. So if we can find ways to, uh, to store um, that energy locally um, and to, to use it locally as well then we're not as reliant on that transmission infrastructure so so that was something that we we really demonstrated um, uh, through the access project and in subsequent projects in places like Orkney as well so matching the uh, the output of the, the Garmini hydro to uh, to local demand new uh, heating demand that we created in um, in, in housing in the area so that 
when there was a, a surplus of, of hydro generation that could be getting absorbed locally and uh, and then used by people in the area instead of sent back to the mainland. But a big part of that is going to be um, uh, getting that enabled by having better legislation around local supply of energy. And uh, there is some interesting um, uh, legislation proposed to this um, that's going through Parliament at the moment, although fairly early stages. So hopefully these things will come. Uh, just on a kind of practical front, um, we've been asked if we're recording the session and yes, we are. So um, if you signed up for the session, we'll be emailing a link out to uh, the webinar afterwards, but you can find this on all of our other um, webinars on our Vimeo channel. If you just search Vimeo Community Land Scotland, you'll find them all. Um, looks like that's everything for today. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers who've um, given us some very enlightening presentations today. And thanks to everyone else who, who's joined us today. Thank you. Hope, you. hope to see you at our next event. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.